Harvard Divinity School. Call, respond, and serve. The role of spirituality in public theology and politics. October 24th, 2023. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to a conversation on service and the role of spirituality in public theology. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to our co-sponsors. This, this, this program is sponsored by the Buddhist Ministry Initiative, and the co-sponsors are the Center for the Study of World Religions and the Harvard Divinity School Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. I also want to express my gratitude to our supporting team who made the program possible and may be invisible to you today, so I want to give them a shout out. Uh, the audiovisual team, the facilities team, the communications team, the Office of Development and External Relations, and finally, but not final, Jonathan McCransky, who has done everything to make this thing go. So thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to all our other sponsors. <clears throat> our guests tonight are former Mayor Mary Laurie, Mary, former Mayor Lightfoot and Pamela Io Detende. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the University of Chicago Law School. She was an assistant uh, United States attorney who also served in other governmental positions with the Chicago Police Department and the Office of Emergency Management. And later, Mayor Lightfoot was a law partner at My Meyer Brown. Mayor Lightfoot served as the 56th mayor of Chicago. She was the second woman, first African-American female, and the first openly gay person to ever serve as mayor in Chicago. Her tenure ran from May, 19, May 2019 to May 2023. Mayor Lightfoot is currently a 2023 Senior Leadership Fellow at the Harvard H.T. Chan, Chan School of Public Health, where she is a Senior Fellow <clears throat> teaching a course on leadership and decision-making in public health. Our other guest is Pamela Ayo Atendo, Utendi, who is a pastoral counselor in private practice, a community dar dharma teacher, a human rights advocate, and the author of Casting Indra's Net, Fostering Spiritual Kinships and Community, which is the conversation that we're gonna to have tonight. Along with that, um, she has written many books, but the two that I'm gonna speak about today uh, uh, she and I co-edited Black and Buddhist, What Buddhism Can Teach Us About Race, Resilience, Transformation, and Freedom. And her new book, which is out, which is a part of our conversation today, which is Casting Indra's Net, Fostering Spiritual Kinship and Community. In addition to that, um, Ayo is an associate editor with Lions Roar Magazine and Buddha Dharma. If you, haven't, if you don't know those two publications, you check them out. Uh, and has hosted many podcasts and interviews for, for those two magazines. <coughs> if you have any questions about Ayo, uh, please visit her website for more information, and books are outside to be purchased if you're interested. So please join me in welcoming our guest tonight. <laughs> Thank you. This is Cheryl Giles, <laughs> in case you didn't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, before we begin, I'd like to um, ask a favor of us. I know that we have rights and um, the expression of our free speech rights have been, uh, I can say in the news quite a bit lately, especially the expression of uh, thought at Harvard in the news all the time. Actually, I was thinking, you know, that phrase, what uh, uh, goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Or well, what's being said at Harvard does not stay at Harvard. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the favor I'm asking is that we bring to this conversation uh, deep listening skills. Deep listening. I'm calling this, this is an experimental practice called listen up listen up, as in listen upward. Listen in a way that people can be kind and also authentic, 
safe and seen, um, witnessed to, and also invited into dialogue. And so this, this practice is um, inspired by the uh, Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism. And I'll just go through it briefly. Just please uh, consider it as an invitation. When we listen, we engage in self-forgetting. So this kind of listening is, is selfless. It's an act of generosity. When we engage in this kind of listening, we do so not to hear what we want to hear. And when we hear what we don't want to hear, we refrain from convincing ourselves that we heard something else. In other words, we try to abide with what is real. By forming the intention to listen this way, we will be perceived, in many cases, as being a listener. And by being perceived as the listener, the person who is being heard has a better chance of being experienced in their true being, being witnessed to and having a sense of belonging, which is something, a desire that many of us share. Patience is involved in right listening. So as we all know, we can't listen to someone go on and on <laughs> and on, right? But we can practice patience when we realize that what, what we want from the communication is not something that we're getting, which will then take us back to the second point because there is likely to be tension in this listening. There's gonna be some tension. How do we resolve that tension? Uh, maybe through the practices of mindfulness and what I would call skillful interruption. Yeah. Right listening involves right speech, which means no unnecessary interruptions and no imposition of our own story to minimize another's communication. Right listening is also paying attention to another's suffering, especially another's suffering, whether it's in the story itself, whether it's in the pattern of speech, whether it's in the body or a combination of all of these factors. Uh, this listening up practice, this right listening, also means being skillful to enhance one's ability to listen. And this would include mindfulness and a meditative posture throughout the entire conversation. And then lastly, right listening as a practice, uh, I believe, aids in our individual and collective enlightenment, which then diminishes, uh, in Buddhism we call it Mara, it uh, diminishes the power of deluded thought. So it's an invitation. I hope you will accept it. Thank you. So let's begin with a quote from this book, um, sorry, uh, Indra's uh, uh, Net. Um, uh, it's on page 148, but that's, you don't necessarily need to know that. This is from Io. Uh, it is our job, if we are to call ourselves human beings or beings trying to be human in our short time on Earth to figure out how we are going to be, survive, and support one another to be, survive, and hopefully thrive? How will we not only reduce the bloody fingers and add to the fragrant flowers on our garlands, but also help to others to do the same? It will take help, and it will take some time for us to consider what it means to be part of a community in the cosmology or cosmos of our existence. So my question, the question that I want to start with is, what does it mean to be part of a community? I think that touches on what you've written and certainly uh, your experience and also, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, your experience running a huge city, um, urban city where there are lots of issues that, that everyone thinks needs to be fixed right away. <laughs> One or two. <laughs> One or two, right. Yeah. So yeah, let's start there. Well, I've already spoken, so how about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, um, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Um, it, what it means to be in community, I think really um, depends in part on the circumstances. I wonder if we can lower this microphone a little bit. It's a little loud. Thank you. Um, that was, a, I think, a constant 
quest and, and struggle um, during my tenure as mayor because we went through so many um, really life upending um, circumstances, um, even before uh, the pandemic hit. And look, I, the, the, the winds of, of change that have been buffeting, I think, our country um, began blowing long before um, a certain former president came down the escalator in 2015. And I think what we, where we are in this moment, particularly in light of what's happening um, every day in Washington, or probably better said, what's not happening every day in Washington, is we have to find our center as a, as a people, um, as a country, and certainly as a community. There's so much emphasis placed on what our differences are and exacerbated in every forum, every media mode possible. What I think we've lost track of is what actually brings us together. And as a mayor of a third largest city in the country going through epic um, upheavals, um, not only because of the present moment issues, but you know, things that happened in our city from the pandemic, from the peaceful um, protests turned into uh, violence, to the escalation of violence, on and on and on, unearth really these deep wells of injustice that to me were kind of flashing like neon signs and required us to address them. We couldn't look away, we couldn't walk away. We needed to address them because that's what the moment I think demanded and that's what our people really needed. So finding that sense of community to co that common ground to really come together and solve seemingly big intractable problems was a journey that we were on very early on in my tenure and really we continued on that journey and it had lots of twists and turns which I'm happy to um, talk about in detail. But there were everything that happened forced us to constantly reckon with the question of who is our community? How do we find that common ground? How do we bring people together despite the seeming dif differences and frankly, the continuing toxicity of public um, debate? Um, that was a huge challenge. I, but I think in some ways we were successful. Um, but there's a lot more work clearly that needs to be done. You don't undo what has been building for years, even in four years, and certainly we didn't have an even plane that we were traveling on. There was a lot of upheaval, as you all know, and particularly not when people's sense of certainty about life themselves was really ripped out from under them. I never realized how much I depended upon the predictability of today and tomorrow and the next day until that predictability was taken away. Yeah. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. We haven't arrived at where our level is gonna be. So this question of community, to me, couldn't be uh, more timely than what it is right now. Thank you. Lyle, you wanna, yeah. from your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about uh, the fact that I moved to Chicago um, just three and a half years ago and when you were mayor and how difficult it was, how it was to uh, drive into the city of Chicago that I thought I knew and be excited by the, how dynamic it is and the streets were empty. I mean, this is, do y'all remember? Oh yeah. Um, it was such a, um, almost like a science fiction existence that we've come out of. I can't even imagine trying to run things in a normal way yeah. with the abnormalities mm -hmm. that we were facing. And I think, uh, I think we all know, at least scientists know, that we suffer when we don't have community. We have truly suffered. One of the reasons why I wanted to advocate for being intentional about community making is because we can't escape each other. <laughs> I mean, that's the fact. You know, we're doing everything, some of us are doing everything possible to uh, delude our minds into believing that we don't belong to each other. Um, and since there is that, we need to make an effort to remind people we actually 
are together. There's nowhere you can go where you won't be with others. Um, so don't waste your time and money trying to escape. Let's use that energy to figure out how we can be with one another and enjoy one another, support one another. And then to the question um, that you posed, Cheryl, I think um, the recognition that we do belong regardless of when we feel like we don't, regardless of when people say that we don't, that the fact is, is that we do. And that recognition then can inform what we do next. Now that I am 100% sure that I belong, I would like to take the next step and maybe go to my neighbor's house. Or I would like to join a volunteer group. Or I would like to vote because my voice matters. Or I'd like to show up for something. So we need to actually get out of the, let's say the mode of having adjusted to our isolation. Mm -hmm because we have adjusted, because our mind, this is what I've learned over these years, our minds adjust to so many things. Now that we have adjusted to isolation and alienation, we need to make an effort for our well-being to adjust to being in community once again. So Mayor Lightfoot, would you like to talk a little bit more about Chicago? What did Chicago look like in the pandemic when you uh, took leadership of the, of the, of the city? Well, I started in May of 19, so it was months before anyone knew anything about a pandemic. Um, and we, but we faced big challenges, um, as frankly most uh, big cities do. Um, one of the things I was very focused on and motivated me uh, to run was really starting a process systematically of dismantling inequity that had existed for far too long um, in our city. Um, many of you who know Chicago know that we unfortunately are one of the most segregated cities in the country. Um, and that's been a fact for decades. Um, so acknowledging that, acknowledging the role that inequity plays, acknowledging the role that systemic racism plays um, in those inequities that build upon themselves um, was a big part of uh, what we were doing, freeing people. Um, to really live their authentic life, but importantly, making sure that the work of my government, my administration, really reflected the lived experience of all Chicagoans. You know, Chicago has a history of machine politics, and the machine that existed under Richard J. Daley, who was mayor for 5,000 years back in the day, <laughs> that machine doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> But the muscle memory that was created and reflexively people do certain things, act in certain ways, have certain fears and paranoias, that is still very much, unfortunately, baked into the DNA, not only of city workers, but people who interact with city government on a regular basis. Um, if you indulge me, I'll give you an interesting, I think, oh, example. Yeah, yeah. ears open. Yeah. <clears throat> so, there is a um, for now former alderman um, in Chicago. And alderman, for those of you who don't know Chicago, are the city council members. And we have the great fortune in Chicago of having 50 of them. Um, topic for another day. <clears throat> but there are some who, over time, stood out um, in good ways, but unfortunately, given Chicago's history, in notorious ways. And probably one of the most notorious is an alderman, uh, former alderman now named, known as um, Ed Burke. Um, Edward Burke had been an alderman for 40 plus years. He was chairman of uh, the finance committee. He wielded power like a cudgel um, and people bent to his will. While I was running for mayor the f first election, the FBI raided his city hall office and his ward office. And as later was um, portrayed in the indictment that my former uh, colleagues at the US Attorney's Office brought, he was trying to shake down a um, Burger King franchisor. Now this guy was probably the largest franchisee, franchisor 
in the country. So he made lots of money from selling stuff from Burger Kings. But Ed Burke was trying to shake him down to get his property tax appeal work. He tried this nice way of taking him out for lunch at the country club, you know, plying him with niceties and things that you do when you're trying to woo and recruit a client. That didn't work. So he quickly converted to the hard way. And this particular Burger King operator was doing some work on a drive through to improve the quality of service for people who were um, driving their cars to the Burger King to get uh, their Whopper or Whopper Junior or what have you. And um, Ed Burke's office whistled a building inspector to their office. We know from the in indictment that this worker spent about five minutes in the office. And then he went over to the site of the Burger King where the construction work was going on, and he issued a series of bogus citations to shut down the work. Now, most people, and by the way, Ed Burke is going on trial on November 6th, so if you're <coughs> curious, stay tuned. Most people looking at this voluminous indictment focused on the tape-recorded conversations that the government had uh, uh, of Burke doing one alleged crime versus another. I focused on that piece with the building inspector. And the reason why is, and this goes back to my point about the muscle memory of the machine, this building inspector dutifully went to the office, the ward office of this powerful alderman, and then presumably got some instructions to take action against this recalcitrant person who wouldn't yield to the will of Ed Burke, made up a series of bogus tickets to shut down this operation and didn't think anything more about it. So the lesson I take from that is, in order to reform a government, to bend to the will of the people, not the other way around, you have to make sure that not only you set the um, vision at the top, you need to make sure that that vision is alive and well at all levels of government, particularly those who are front serving, facing, those who have the power to interface with the public, and those who have power like this building inspector. Because until you change the hearts and minds of people at that level, it's very difficult to get anything done. Because many of them will think, well, we'll just wait the mayor out. She'll be gone in time. Her people will be gone. But we will be here. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't believe in the, the deep state and all that nonsense. But I do believe that governmental institutions and other institutions have been conditioned to turn their back on the human condition for far too long. And if we're really going to think about this sense of community, that we belong to each other, that we truly are part of IndrusNet, as I think Io um, really spells out so eloquently um, in her book, then we have, to, we have to break through these silos that are set up to separate us from each other. And there's no f f more fundamental um, obligation, I think, of government than for people to deliver services to their fellow residents, to see each other in their work. So our mantra was equity and inclusion. Every city department was embedded with equity officers. Eddie, every um, commissioner on down understood that they had to view their work through the lens of equity that we couldn't deprive certain neighborhoods of services, even if that's the way it had been done for forever. We had to upend that thinking. Now, I'm not going to say that we changed the world around in four years' time, but I think we made some great strides forward. Um, and it served us well then when we went into the equity. I'll stop there because I've been talking for far too long. But um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to heal what is broken at every level in our society. I, I was going to say uh, that I hear you, but can you have, can you create equity, and this is the topic that we talked about here and we're working on here, without community and trust, or trust and community? No, you, you can't. 
but you have to do each thing at the same time. You have to demand and talk about as a mantra this notion of equity. You've got to demonstrate in concrete terms what that means um, and, and then lead by example and uplift those examples. You have to celebrate the people who are the champions uh, for equity within uh, an organization. So that's the way you start to bake in a different kind of ethos um, is really to talk about it, educate about it, and then demonstrate in concrete terms um, what that means and how to manifest itself. Because otherwise, people who are used to just doing things the old way, when you talk about equity, and I remember when I first came into office and I'd go into certain rooms and I'd talk about why we needed to do better for people in our city, not just the downtown area, but our neighborhoods, which were starved of resources. I'd make the uh, moral case for it. I'd make the financial case for it, um, the economic case. And people just would, some would politely smile. Yeah. Most would just glaze over. But being determined and repetitive in this and demanding accountability around a certain set of principles and not letting the criticism the, uh, really throw you off your mission to change things around, but more importantly, to deliver for people. And I, you're gonna hear me say this a lot, in concrete, tangible ways, that's what we really focused on. And then you can start turning around. And my goal was that if people get a sense of and an appetite for what is possible, they will never allow anyone ever again, no mayor, no city council member, to cheat them of their birthright of equity and inclusion. What do you, well, you, you said something that um, I'm, I'm taking a risk in uh, speaking for all of us <laughs> in the divinity schools across the world. <laughs> across the world, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna that's do a, that. That's a big, bold statement. I know, but, but here it is, because you said it. If we are going to change the hearts and minds, that is the contemplation of seminaries and divinity schools and leadership schools that are about transformation if we are going to change the hearts and minds. And are we going to do the work to change our own hearts mm -hmm. and minds? That, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Right? That's, that's our work. So I just want to throw that out there for whatever purpose um, that might serve. Um, because when we think about whether our uh, service, the call, so to speak, what am I being called to, what's calling me, uh, what makes me lean forward and sacrifice what I've been doing in order to attend to this um, has to do with this, this transformation. So you talked about, Mayor Lightfoot, you talked about this uh, change of heart and mind being manifest in everyday government workers, right? And I think largely we don't think about, quote unquote, because we use this word bureaucrats, <laughs> We're not thinking about the transformations that they have gone through or that they might want to go through in order to have equity and um, inclusion as the end game. And I just wondered if you had an insight on that or thoughts. You know, um, <clears throat> the city of Chicago had 30,000 employees, um, a large amount, not a small amount. <clears throat> I'm confident I didn't meet um, but a small percentage of them. <clears throat> but the goal is to set up a structure where this ethos of equity and inclusion touches everyone. <clears throat> so I hired and empowered the first ever um, uh, chief equity officer for the city. She built an infrastructure across city government um, where there were equity officers in each department. They then trained their peers 
um, and held our, so we held ourselves accountable to a certain set of values manifested in hiring, employment, purchasing, um, delivery of services, the things that government do, does on a regular basis, the manifestations of what that means, but doing it in such a way that we, we were conscious of who we were touching, how we were touching them, and making sure that people felt heard and that their lives were valued in the work that we were doing. You know, just going through the motions was not good enough for me. When I have people, as I did, tell me, I've never seen a mayor in my neighborhood before. You're the first mayor that's ever come here. You're the first mayor that I've ever met. I didn't think it was even possible. I didn't even know City Hall saw us. This is the first time that we've gotten our roads paved, our, our streets shoveled. Right? This is not that long ago, right? Months ago. Every, every month of every year that I was in office, some person said something like that to me. And you know, on the one hand, I was heartened by it because it meant to me that I was doing the right things and being in the right places. But it also felt devastating to hear that, that after so long, and people are very proud of being Chicagoans and suspicious of those of us who are not native-born Chicagoans. But to hear people say, I never thought that anybody in government cared about me and my family and my neighborhood, because that's really what they were saying, whether explicitly or not, that meant that we had to do better, that we were on the right path, but that we had to keep going. So neglect was a, mo a motivator. It, it, was a, it, was, it certainly was a, the, the, the decades of neglect, I think, certainly motivated me and my, my team. Um, but more, it, it was getting back to first principles about what is public service. It is serving the public, first and foremost. And look, doing the people's work is not easy. As a, a friend of mine told me when I took on, you know, one or more um, seemingly thankless tasks, but there's nothing more satisfying when you get it right and you have that sense of appreciation that people feel when they, despite their skepticism, despite feeling like they've been lied to, that there's somebody there who sees them and is doing what is necessary to make their lives better and more vibrant. And to me, I will carry that with me for the rest of my life. So how does this map onto Indra's net? Mm. You write about violence and polarization. Uh, and we're just talking about locally here, not, not <clears throat> globally. <clears throat> well, I just think that we have choices. Uh, we have choices about how we're going to be with one another. And some of the uh, choices that I see being played out now are um, in, in very dramatic ways. I mean, it's been the case for, for probably as long as this country's been around, but in very dramatic ways now. I pay taxes, and therefore I should have a say in what you receive from government. And I'm willing to berate you publicly. I'm willing to dox you. I'm willing to go to city uh, uh, school board meetings and um, attack teachers and school board members. I'm willing to threaten librarians. For me, this is a very heightened level of um, the lack of, of civility, as if we don't share space, that we don't share resources, that we don't share a well, you, common you, aim. You coined a word yeah. um, in the book. Mobbery. mobbery. Yes. Yeah. It's mobbery. Yeah. Mobbery. Like robbery yeah. only. Yeah. Mobbery. Mobbery. Um, actually, I saw that in a, something similar to that in an article recently about a discourse, that even our discourse is like mobbery. 
gathering together in groups of people and yelling other people down um, until they submit to what appears to be our, our opinion. Um, so it is a distortion of, of how we can be in the web. We are making decisions, this inescapable network of our mutuality, uh, what Dr. Martin Luther King called it. Uh, it's a distortion of our light, our ability to shine and reflect each other's goodness, that we shut down, that we get wrapped around greed and righteousness uh, and fear and deprive people of resources. It's the kind of um, anti-communitas, -com I'm going to use that word, anti-communitas that says um, that the public schools the high schools in Houston, that they will close down the libraries in the high schools in Houston, close down the libraries, and make those spaces detention centers <laughs> for troubled kids, which you know is just shortens the pipeline to prison. Right? This is the situation we're in. And um, how are we going to? We must work through it. And government is going to be part of it and it is part of the problem. And government is us, right? So changing hearts and minds as we are inseparable from government means that we need to find solutions. We need to have elected, we need to be electing officials who are willing to tell the truth about the situations we find ourselves in and be solution oriented, I think, rather than retaliation oriented. You know, when some, someone has an agenda of retaliation, that's the agenda, they shouldn't be in government, in my view. Well, let me also jump in here and say, yes, of course, the government has a, I think, important role to play, <clears throat> but we only exist in government to serve you. And if people of goodwill stand on the sidelines, <clears throat> watch the destruction and the tearing down, and don't stand up, for what's right and values and treat the vitriol like a, a sporting event on TV, then we will lose. And there's no path to come back together. You know, I'm not naive in the slightest, and I think most people who know me well would say I'm pretty much a cynic about lots of things, but I do believe that the mass, vast majority of Americans care about each other, care about our values, care about their neighbors. But we have to show that care and concern in small ways and big ways. And for me, as somebody who watches the government and small d democracy devolve, I think it's really a tragedy if we don't stand up and save who we are, our identity, ourselves, and not let the people with the largest megaphone, the largest, loudest voices dominate the discussion. They do not represent the majority. And when I say they, I mean people left, right, and center who are screaming, they don't represent the vast majority of us. And yet we allow them we allow them through our passivity, our silence, our standing on the sidelines, we allow them to speak for us. And I think that's something that we've got to right that ship as quickly as possible. Yeah. So and how so this is my question to both of you. How are we going to shift that? I'm listening <clears throat> to this. I, I understand Indra's net net, I understand this concept of uh, interdependence, interconnection. Uh, and what I see in terms of both community and our government, uh, the kind of behavior that people exhibit is far from that. So how, how are we going <clears> to, <throat> we're a long way from home. Yeah. And mm -hmm. How are we going to get there? Yeah, we're a long way from home. You talked about uh, finding our center. We mm -hmm. need to find it. Here's an idea I'd like to share with you. Now, I already sh shared one very brilliant idea <laughs> with uh, Mayor Lightfoot some, some time ago. Did you act on it? OK. <laughs> anyway, um, so here's another one. I think it's a good idea. All right. I really now, do. I want to now she's calling me out in public. No, 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 no. I know, I know it's being worked on.
So I was pondering and pondering. I bet, I bet many of you have been pondering too. I mean, the situation requires pondering, calls for pondering. I thought, what would it be like, is this has a little bit to do with my own service history. Mm -hmm. I thought, what would it be like if, the, if President Biden were to sign an executive order creating a domestic Peace Corps where volunteers would sign up to work for someone in the party that's not their own. Uh, wow. Hmm. As a way. I told you what the, the Peace Corps name, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it'd be easy, but um, what would that be like to encourage people, to support people, and truly working across the aisle, so to speak, when they are young? And then coming together for meetings to talk about their experiences, sharing and so on, because they will be our future leaders. That's just one idea. So I decided I'd write our senators. I like living in Illinois. <laughs> because then I can write senators who I think would resonate with my ideas. But I've written Adam Kinzinger. I wrote about that um, in Casting Andrews Net when he represented former representative um, Republican who received death threats um, because he was not going to be down with lying and so on. And I thought, and, and his family abandoning him. And I just felt that. I was like, I know what that's like to have family abandon you. So I called him to offer some pastoral support. This is what we need to do, I think, one of the ways to find our center. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, one of the things that we focus on is the, what you say, the emptiness of phenomenon, meaning we put a lot of weight into the belief or the delusion that identities are concrete, they're real, they're permanent, they're unchangeable, right? Mm -hmm. But from a Buddhist perspective, the phenomenon really is, is emptiness. It's pliable, it's uh, impermanent, it's changeable, um, and the reality is far beyond and deeper and wider than the identity, the labels that we use. So to, to dwell into that phenomenal, phenomenological state of being is one way that we can begin to see each other as a uh, in my view, the relatives that we are for one another. Sorry. I bet cynics don't like that talk. Well, I was thinking <laughs> as you were um, as you were talking about your idea of the domestic <laughs> peace corps. Um, I saw, I think it was on um, CBS Sunday Morning, which I'm a huge fan of and addicted to. Um, the young man he has some famous heritage, which I've now forgotten. But the concept is this. Um, high school seniors are graduating in that summer before they go off to do whatever it is they're going to do. Urban high schoolers go into rural areas for a week or two, live with families um, in those areas, um, and then the kids from the rural areas go to live in urban areas for the same period of time um, to just get a sense of what the rest of life was. And this particular episode focused on these kids from the, the Bay Area who went, I think, to Oklahoma, um, to the, a rural farming community um, where there were actual cows and horses and people were cowboys. And um, they got to live with these families and, and meet their peers who had a very different sense of life than they did. You know, and they came and they had the dyed hair and the piercings and the whole bit. But um, really got to know these kids on a very basic level. And then the same thing, those kids from the rural community went <clears throat> to stay in Oakland and San Francisco and other parts of the Bay Area. And I thought, what a wonderful thing mm -hmm. that we are, <clears throat> they are spending time to get to know each other and having these um, impressions and experiences at a time I hope that their minds are still open and not closed and hardened by life's journey. More of that mm -hmm. is what we need. Yeah. Certainly. I don't know what the answer is for people 
of our age. Um, maybe discussions like this, but I'd like to think that the door doesn't close at any age, that we still have the ability to learn and love um, and open our hearts and be vulnerable. Um, because I think we are in a, at a precipice and something needs to happen and happen soon for us to come to come back from the potential destruction. As, as someone that's been teaching here for a number of years, I'm really excited about Generation Z, uh, particularly with their focus on you know, innovation and, and those kinds of things uh, as an opportunity. Uh, and I th I th if you pair that with a spirituality mm -hmm. or a spiritual practice or a religious tradition, that gives me a sense of hope. Uh, and it may just, you know, uh, because I think with that, the, the sort of religious or spiritual practice, uh, at least our students have uh, some understanding of the kind of embedded values and practices and traditions and uh, beliefs that they, they're bringing to the process. And I, I think that uh, this is my question for both of you. So where, uh, where is mutuality? Where is spirituality, the spiritual practices, the values? Uh, how, how can they help sustain us through um, navigating through the, the kind of polarization and violence that we're seeing? <clears throat> I think that's the only way that we're going to make it through. <clears throat> If, if, if we see spirituality, spiritual practice as imbued with ethical uh, concerns, ethical commitments, um, if not, you can be spiritual and believe that only your people should inhabit the earth. That's, that's a spiritual or religious position. But how does that manifest in the lives of others? And I think the major world traditions to some degree, are concerned about the other. Right? Um, how do we treat the stranger? How do we express hospitality? Mm -hmm. How do we speak truth to power? How do we give when it's difficult to give? How do we express devotion to things that are greater than ourselves? How do we celebrate the um, setting of the sun and the rising of the moon. I mean, how do we do all these things? We need to be engaged in all of these things. Otherwise, we are, we continue to feed, I think, the um, uh, anthropocentric, anthropocentric view that only our species matters and we can do whatever we want to all other living beings on this planet and the planet itself. It, there's a passage that you wrote about from your experience um, that's reflected in the book that <clears throat> really struck me. And it's a mm -hmm. story of, uh, I think you were 12, and you were sitting in church. Oh, yeah. And you heard this plaintive scream from outside. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the congregation just continued on. Mm, I remember that. I'm sure everybody had to hear it, it sounded like. Mm. But um, you got up to investigate. Everyone else stayed. And then when you came back, what I read into it was that you felt like they were judging you and looking at you like, <clears throat> why did you break from the form, from the pack, to go investigate somebody else's suffering? Yeah. And <clears throat> and, and what really struck me was kind of the constant, and I alluded to this before, the bystander syndrome. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect me. Even in a group of folks who profess to be religious and have a sense of faith, they weren't moved enough in their faith to investigate the potential suffering of someone else. That really struck me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's apropos of the moment that we are in and what we've been talking about, which is people have to stand for something. It's not enough to profess your faith, your spirituality. Um, you know, I'm a Christian, and there's a passage from James 2 that says, <clears throat> faith without works is dead. And what that means to me is, You've got to manifest what you believe in what you do. And you lead by example. The 
as a Christian, you know, I believe that Jesus was here in our, in our midst to lead us and show what it meant to be faithful, what it meant to sacrifice, what it meant to care and have concern about others. And in our lives, if we truly have faith, and I think that's an ethos that runs through all the major religions, minor religions, but if we're really truly people of faith, we've got to demonstrate that. And particularly when it comes to extending ourselves to help someone else who is vulnerable and in need. So, so let me just build on that because I'm trying to figure out how we navigate, how we, how we how we locate ourselves. So we know that over the last five or seven years, it's been probably even a decade at this point, a uh, huge increase where people have moved away from churches mm -hmm. to, you know, on, on Sunday and that kind of thing. Uh, and so what happens to our spiritual practice? What happens to the traditions, spiritual traditions, religious traditions? They're, they're being evolved into different kinds of ways of celebrating, but are people really connecting around their values are, are they are those values then a part of their life and what and, and, and their purpose? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to see how that you know the, the pulling away from the institutional churches that most of us used to attend in some way. This is a huge transition in, in, in the U.S. This this the Gallup poll and so how do we get reminded about our spirituality and our values and that kind of thing? Is it in the family? Is it in our community? Uh, Indresnet, if there's going to be inter interdependence, right, it seems to me that, that there has to be some agreed acknowledgement, uh, some way that we know, I know that I can trust you, that you sort of um, show you have, you know, you're loving and you're kind. And, uh, they're not taught in schools, at least not in public schools. So how do we, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how, 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 how what's the map look like? How do we get, get there? Where, now, where is it that we're trying to go? Well, so, so uh, you know, these are lovely ideas, but I see the institutional church is pulled back. Right. Yes. The communities are fragmented. Right. So, so who, 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 who is guiding us? How, how, you know, who's our mentor? Who is? Here's, what, here's one of the things that I see. <clears throat> one of the things that I see is the secularization of religious practices. And so sometimes people enter into a secularized form, and then they're like, yeah, this is really cool. Where did this come from? Well, it came from this tradition. Oh, I'd like to know more about that tradition. That doesn't mean that they become a member of a community in that tradition, but it's, sometimes it's the secularization of something that introduces people to the tradition. Um, but if the tradition and the traditional methods and modes of being don't help people be resilient in the face of um, these existential challenges, then what is the point? Mm -hmm. There's really not much of a point to it other than community. And if that institution is not good at building community and providing those kind of communal needs, then what is the point? And I think that's one of the reasons why we see people leaving. Um, there have also been many leaders who have bought into other um, I can say allegiances that are not nourishing to the soul and to the spirit. And I don't want to get too political, but I think mm -hmm. you know what I mean in that. So I don't think that uh, just being a traditionalist is what's being called for. But Cheryl, you mentioned Generation Z and that you have hope in genera Generation Z because of um, their, in uh, because they're innovative. Um, I would like to suggest that, um, that all generations have value, and we are stronger if we can work intergenerationally. And it pains me when I hear younger people talk about the um, irrelevance, the obsolescence of older people. It, does, it hurts, maybe because I'm older now, maybe. <laughs> Um, but I know this, they wouldn't be where they are, but for where their elders have been, and there should be some appreciation for yeah. that. Yeah. Likewise, we get tired when we get old. 
And so we can't do. Can you, can you talk to my 15 year old? Yeah, I'm happy to. <laughs> you have a 15 year old, I have a 27 year old. We can't, um, we can't do all the things that we used to do. And so we need young people, not just to do, but to think and see and inform us. And we need to share wisdom because wisdom doesn't come just from being cool or being innovative. It comes from living a life, having encountered pain and suffering and working through it. So we need each other. Um, and the institutions, the religious and spiritual institutions, don't look like they used to and won't look like they used to. Yeah. And we have these big empty buildings and people are doing all they can to keep them up and running and they're not gonna be up and running much longer. The bricks are falling just right, right there. Right. Yeah. I guess what I would say, and then I'll just draw upon my own experience that um, I think people will continue just as they're questioning all forms of institutions no matter what it is. It's not a surprise that people are questioning the institutions of various um, religions, um, no matter what it is. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I grew up in the church. Um, I had parents that were God-fearing, raised in the South. We went to church on Wednesday for Bible study, on Saturday for junior this, junior that, and then all day Sunday. Um, but I, when I could, I moved as quickly as I could away from the church. Um, part of it was I was realizing my sexuality and there was no space for that um, in my faith tradition at the time. Um, part of it was I was a strong female and there was zero interest in having female leadership. Um, in my faith tradition. So I moved far away from institutional religion for decades. Um, but I will tell you, nothing like a pandemic to humble you. Um, and so people ask me all the time, how did you get through it? In a lot of different ways, but I definitely you know, re rekindled my relationship with my faith. No question about it. I found myself... Um, in prayer, frequently, seeking guidance, being still enough to try to listen, um, because I believe that not only um, that God tries to reach us and send messages um, by humbling us in circumstances, making us stop and listen and be still to receive the message. Um, I also think that we... Our faith is manifest in the lives of other people. Um, their journeys are something that's important for us to recognize and take notice of. You know, again, I have lots of challenges and struggles with organized religion for the reason that I've said. And unfortunately, as we see, it feels like every week one of the major uh, religions in the country um, has to admit to some scandal or some other issue. <clears throat> But I think the core beliefs, people are hungry for that, and they're searching for it. And it may not be in the four walls of a church or a mosque or a synagogue or some other house of worship, but people are hungry for the truth. Mm -hmm. They're hungry for something that feel, gives them a sense of attachment to this life and meaning um, when they don't otherwise find it in other means. So I actually think it's my sense that the spiritual connection is actually going up, even while there may not be butts and seats on Sunday or whatever the day of worship may be. I think that sense of longing and that sense of connection is increasing, not decreasing. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. She's giving us a high sign, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh, great. Okay. Is, it is it that time? Okay. Well. Ready? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, one question is, when religion is sometimes used in politics to divide, gain power, and position groups against each other, often at the expense of minority groups, how can we speak about spirituality in such a context? It's a great question. And I would just do a friendly edit and say, not just sometimes, way too often. Mm -hmm. It's 
constantly being hijacked for people's individual and group political agendas. Um, and there again, I think people of goodwill, people of faith had to push back and not allow that to happen with, in silence, in a vacuum. Um, it is stunning to me some of the things that we've seen over the last seven Absolutely. plus years, mm -hmm. and how um, religion has been weaponized in this country. Now, that's true throughout time. I'm, I know enough of my history to know that. Um, but it really seems dramatic in the last five plus years of how that's happened. But also how many churches have been silent, like your example. Yeah, and I, and I will say this about the weaponization. I mean, this is, it's truly weaponized in this way. So the previous administration, um, you know, this was not part of the campaign. It was not part of the campaign to openly target uh, LGBTQ people. All right, remember the signs, LGBTQ people, gay people for this, gay people. Okay, but shortly after taking office, um, the Department of Hum Health and Human Services was basically reconstructed to create systems of oppression against LGBTQ people, um, it primarily transgender people. So there was an Office of Civil Rights that uh, where they created a brand new division um, that would uh, systematically eliminate all the gains made by transgender people under the you know, under the Constitution. And the and what I would think what I think is the most dangerous part of those policies that went I don't think it was ever reported and it popped up again around um, uh, abortion issues, especially in Texas, um, would be the awarding, if you will, of citizens turning in yeah. other citizens. Yeah. 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 No. So, right, so the for example. bounty. Example, yes. The bounty, yeah. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> citizens turning in other citizens is one of the most dangerous things that a government can do um, to, uh, how can I solidify authoritarianism in a country? And so I would say here, uh, leaders, future leaders, people who are concerned about other people, if you know a person's not hurting another person, please do not try to police other people because we just don't know the consequences of doing that. Do you want that on your head? that you help send someone to jail, to prison, off their job. Um, I don't think that's the kind of country that we want to be in. As it, when, it, when I think about speaking about spirituality, when they say the kind of spirituality that they're uh, embracing is the kind that separates us one from the, from the other, one is that that's not really possible. It's not really possible to separate us one from the other. But it's not the kind of spirituality that many of us talk about when we talk about mysticism. And when we talk about mysticism, what we're talking about is transcending these so-called differences that we have with each other and dwelling in that realm of uh, spirit, uh, mystery, love, um, where we don't get caught up mm -hmm. in uh, the semblance of difference. So I have lots of questions for you. Uh, one question is, what is it about your religious tradition or spirituality to care about those people who had been neglected so long, to care about equity and inclusion? So what from, what from your religious tradition helps you, encourages you to care about people who have been neglected so long? For me? For that's for you. I don't want to vote. I do think there's something innate in us that gives us a sense of empathy and compassion. And for me, it's, it's, it's not just my religious and faith tradition, but it's also just being a human being living through life. 
I I'm, grew up in the 60s and 70s. And when a, at a time when <clears throat> discrimination against black people in this country was still very much the rule of the day. I knew there were certain things I couldn't do, certain places I couldn't go, simply because I was black. Even in the Ohio town that I grew up in. And watching <clears throat> how that discrimination manifests itself, and in listening to my parents who grew up, were born in the 1920s and grew up in the segregated South, and in particular my father's stories about how being poor and black <clears throat> in a rural community in Arkansas was life crushing, and the daily fear that he felt, his family felt, that if they did a thing wrong, said the wrong thing, went to the wrong place, that the consequence could manifest itself in intense violence. Understanding that, growing up in the time that I was growing up, seeing how that played itself out on a daily basis in my life and the life of my family members, life of my community, it created a sense of outrage, for sure, but also a determination in me from a really early age to do something about the wrongs that I was seeing. It made me want to be an advocate. I never thought then that I would be an elected official, for sure, but it certainly probably was the seeds that were planted that led me to be a lawyer mm -hmm. um, and led me to feel like my role in life was to fight for people that didn't have a voice, fight for people that were just like me growing up in circumstances like I grew up and to be that voice. So it was in part my faith tradition, but really the way in which the world taught me on my journey in my earliest years is what led me to have that, that fire of advocacy. And I'll just say briefly that um, as a chaplain and pastoral counselor, one of the things that, especially in a public setting, one of the things that I uh, took a vow, in essence, to do is to uh, find out what it is about a person's belief system that is most nourishing to them, that helps them survive in, the, in this world. And so in listening to many stories, engaging in uh, many traditions, um, engaging with um, leaders from various traditions, I, I think that there are so many things that these uh, world traditions share in terms of compassion, love, service, mercy, um, understanding others, uh, generosity, and so on, that um, even if the institutions don't survive, the lessons are there. The lessons are there, and we don't have to recreate the wheel. For example, no, let me not go there. Mm -mm. Okay, I have to go there now because I said it in public. <laughs> When we employ wisdom, we can avoid certain tragedies, right? So in this country, oftentimes we think we're exceptional, right? This is the United States, the beacon on the hill. The things that happen in other countries would never happen here, and it's happening. Right. Are we going to let it get to the point of genocide before we say, I just, I just, I wish that had never happened. I saw it happening, I wish I had said something. Or my worst fear, which I talk about in the book a little bit, is I never killed anybody until I killed my neighbor. I never turned someone in because they belonged to a certain belief group until I was forced to because my government asked me to do that that they're good patriots are like that. I never did anything to anybody until it was between me and them, and I chose myself. <clears throat> we don't have to get to that point, but that's the road we're on. Let's be clear about that. So this question is, is sort of in line with what you just were 
speaking about. So changing hearts and minds requires not only a skillful teacher and friend, but also a willing lit listener and audience. Recognizing that the most unwilling audiences are sometimes the ones most in need of guidance and ch change, what are some ways in which we should approach this dialogue? And when is it wise to leave? When should we approach the dialogue and when is it wise to leave? Yes. <clears throat> well, I, I, I said the phrase earlier that doing the people's work is not easy. And that's precisely what I was talking about. When you go into, in my experience, when you go into communities, settings, where people have been deprived for so long, when they have been lied to, feel like they have heard it all before and I engage you with a huge amount of skepticism. Um, I make the joke often that so many times I've reached my hand out in friendship and drawn back the hand with some digits missing. Mm. But I, I think in all seriousness, you have to be humble enough to listen. You have to have an open heart. You have to recognize people struggle and what their journey has been. And you have to be committed. And there are going to be times when it is very rough going. I've certainly been in many, many circumstances like that in my 30 plus years of public service. But if you know there's something of value, if you come with a pure heart and the right intentions, and you are willing to listen and allow people to um, emote their frustration, their anger, you will get to a better place. I, I know that. That's absolutely been my experience. But you've got to be willing to hang in there. And you've got to be willing to take the string, slings and arrows and have the strength of your convictions to keep coming back, to keep coming back and be present. Um, I'm looking at two people who uh, work for me back in the day who are now Harvard students. Um, and I think they probably can think about lots of stories um, through the work that we did in communities that were historically starved for resources, disinvested, man oh man. Just because you come in and you say, I'm here, I'm bringing resources, I wanna engage, doesn't mean you're gonna be welcome. And in many instances, you're gonna be regarded with <clears throat> deep skepticism. But we were able to break through over and over again because we were willing to take our lumps. Because we knew that we were trying to do something that had a higher purpose. It wasn't about our own individual egos um, and um, our, the wounds that we might suffer. We had to push through. We knew it was important. And when that breakthrough those breakthrough moments came, there was no better experience. Yeah, I'm looking in the room and I, and I think there are some uh, spiritual leaders in this room, yes? Oh, now they're shy, now they're getting shy. Yeah, like they're, they're, they're all <laughs> dressed up in their, in their religious leader garb but no one's admitting to the, the fact that they're a religious leader. I, I mentioned that to say that people will be looking to us for answers, a response. And when you engage in the cult, being cultivated as a religious leader, I think it's reasonable uh, to, um, to think that you're taking on the responsibility of having an answer, of having a response, of getting to know the people who are part of your community and saying, you know what I see in you? I see that you have the ability to fill in the blank, to serve the community in this way or that way. Um, so that when, sorry, so um, in this cultivation of religious leadership, don't we have to trust ourselves? We have to trust ourselves. And even if we're not as uh, religious leaders, you know when you have that feeling. That what I just heard and what I saw made me feel uncomfortable. Oh, God. Um, hmm. I think I can say I felt uncomfortable when, let me fill in the blank, that's an I statement. 
So you're not blaming anybody for what they said or felt, didn't say, um, but you're claiming your lack of comfort with it. Hopefully they'll be uh, curious about that. Oh, can you tell me more about that? And even if they're not, it's like, well, I know you didn't ask me you know, to tell you more about it, but let me tell you why I feel uncomfortable about that. Right? Because if we're not doing that, if we're not standing up for truth, justice, equity, inclusion, compassion, love, care, and so on, why are we wearing what we're wearing? Why are we showing up for what we're showing up for? Why have we invested in this education? Maybe we just need more work. Um, when to get out, when it's not safe to be in. Now, I'm not <coughs> saying when your ego doesn't feel safe, okay? Because a lot of people say, you know, it's not safe in here because people don't agree with me. <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is you're about to be attacked harshly. Might be time to step back. A few more questions. Uh, you mentioned intergenerational communication and cooperation. How do you envision that happening in community? Intergenerational yeah. communication and cooperation. Seems like it would be natural. First of all, if you're in a community and there are only people in your age group, might you want to ask, why is, why is it that there's no one else outside of our age group in this group? What are we missing? as a result of not having people born in the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. Um, what might we be missing? And if people say, I don't know. Yeah, you know, because your mother, your father, what have you, your aunties were born before you were born, you can ask them. You know what you learned from them. That's what's missing, right? Or yeah, pick up a short book on history. We are where we are today because of many, many uh, Battles, many battles, wars and battles um, that have led us to where we are today. So what have they learned? And why are we not learning from them? All right. Please take this and now innovate and apply. All right. and, and make sure the people who are younger than you are are the beneficiaries of this work. Well, I, I think about that question in a slightly different way, which is I think we have to be intentional about creating spaces for those um, points of connection to happen. Um, you know, as we've been talking about really from the very beginning, there's so many forces that pull us apart that tell us that we don't see that commonality, and I think that definitely happens between the different generations. So building those safe spaces for interaction and frankly programming those spaces uh, for opportunities for intergenerational um, conversations and interactions is very, very important. Um, and IO, I think, is alluding to the fact that sometimes young people don't see the value in people that have gray or less hair um, than they do. I think it's really important that we, it is not presumed that there will be respect for elders, that, that's not the world we live in these days, unfortunately. Um, I think we have to be intentional about showing um, the wisdom um, and, and demonstrating why. The why question, I think, is important. Not just that it should happen, but why it should happen. Um, the gratitude for people who have come before, who blazed that trail, who've made the sacrifices <coughs> and created the opportunities that now a current generation takes for granted as their birthright when it wasn't. So knowing that history, telling that history, and being intentional about creating those spaces, I think is very important. Well, this may be a good way to kind of wrap us up. If our goal is to change hearts and minds, what gives you hope that it's possible that, that change is possible? What gives you hope that this kind of change is possible? Look at you all here tonight. Yeah. On a Tuesday night. I was thinking the same right? thing. There's lots of things that you could be doing with your time uh, tonight. Um, you know, I think that I know it's possible because I've seen it manifest over and over and over and over again. Now, it may be in small ways, but I'll take that. That's a building block. 
and then we try to figure out how we duplicate it and replicate it and scale it. Um, as I said earlier, I, I, I just truly believe that the people of goodwill far outnumber the people who want to tear us apart and the vitriol that we see on both sides of the divide. But we have to be intentional and not be bystanders, not be silent. We can set the cultural tone. We can set the, 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 the um, narrative for what should be important in our lives. But we have to care more about that and each other than watching the train wreck happen and being silent and viewing it as entertainment or worse. And I'll just say the, the belief that uh, things appear solid but are not, that we are constantly in process and can change on a dime um, conditions and causes being right. So what do we want to do to make that shift, that energetic shift that can um, be like the butterfly flapping its wings in one part of the world, but felt in another part? So I'll just add this, which is um, from my own experience, uh, uh, strengthening connections, staying connected, and the other thing that really has been powerful for me is receiving mentorship. You know, a lot of people mentor me throughout the year, for, for throughout my years, and being someone who also enjoys mentoring. So you, you got to reach out and ask for help. Uh, and so that's our students know that. Hopefully, they know that 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 you know that you mentor somebody else, somebody else. Is, I mean, we pass this along, and so it's real. That for me, that's really a kind of a powerful thing. Yeah. Cheryl was my mentor. I was just going to say that about you. <laughs> This is my, one of my spiritual teachers, and she's younger than me, so check that out. <laughs> it's not about age, it's about wisdom, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I wouldn't want to, can we Thank express you. gratitude? Pardon? Can, can we, do we have a minute to express gratitude? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for coming. Sponsors, Buddhist Ministry Initiative at HDS, the HDS Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and the Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.